Okay, so the next presentation, change of title again, maybe, I don't know. So actively secure OT extension with optimal overhead, um, given by Marcel Keller, Emanuela, oh, given by Marcel Keller, co-authored with Emanuela Orsini and Peter Shaw. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, so we changed the title because this sounds a bit sexier. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for attending, especially uh, if you happen to be an MPC person. Um, so what is this about? Uh, well, for those who don't have heard about Oblivious Transfer yet, so here we go. Oblivious Transfer is a very basic primitive where we have a sender and a receiver, and the sender inputs two strings. The receiver inputs a choice bit and essentially gets this chosen string as an output. And the whole idea about the security is that uh, uh, nobody learns anything extra, so the sender doesn't learn the receiver's choice, and at the same time, the receiver doesn't learn the string he chose not to learn, or she chose not to learn. Um, a few facts about Oblivious Transfer. Uh, it's complete for multi-party computation, and thus any protocol, because multi-party computation is the most complete protocol you can think of, or scheme. Um, in uh, GMW-like protocols, we need one OT per end gate. So that means, uh, yeah, we need a lot. Um, unfortunately, we need some uh, public key crypto like uh, assumption like DDH or RSA. And uh, there is a recent implementation by Chu and Olandi, and they achieved to uh, generate 10,000 OTs per second. So the question is, uh, how, can you, how can you be faster? Or, uh, yeah, how can you do, how can you achieve more? And, and uh, this is essentially the idea of OT extension. So you start out with a few OTs, add some cheap symmetric crypto, and as an output you get many OTs without running the uh, actual OT protocol again, so no uh, public key crypto at that stage. And uh, this was brought up by Ishai et al. at Crypto 2003. And they proposed their, uh, like, a passively secure, honest but secure uh, is construction, which is uh, secure against an honest but curious um, adversary. At the, same, at the same time, they also had an uh, actively secure construction uh, based on cut and shoes. So hence, uh, the big overhead in terms of communication from uh, passive uh, to active. Uh, later, uh, Nielsen et al. and Asharov et al. Uh, came up uh, with uh, proposals that reduced the amount of communication per extended OT, but there was still an overhead in those works. And uh, what we present here in this work uh, is essentially for free. So asymptotically, um, we're just going to communicate as much as uh, for uh, passively secure OT extension. And uh, all those figures are for sender random OT, that is, uh, the sender doesn't, in the extended OT, the sender doesn't get to choose uh, its inputs, so there is a bit, uh, if you want to have like normal OT, uh, you need to do like kind of a, a correction, which just essentially just means more communication. Okay, so, uh, what's, uh, what's the idea? How does it work? So, as I said, we start with a few OTs. Sometimes they're called seed OTs. Uh, uh, here we call them base OTs. And those are a few short OTs. So, kappa, uh, think, uh, kappa of, think of kappa as a security parameter. So, that's like 128 uh, in, the, in, in the example of the... In the a table of the previous slide, so 128 OTs of length 128. And then in a first extension step, we extend the length with a PRG. And as a result, we get kappa random OTs of length N. And now imagine N is big, much bigger than kappa. And then we introduce a correlation. I will come in a minute to what it means, uh, what it means a correlated OT. So, as a result, we get kappa correlated OTs with length n. And then the uh, interesting thing about correlation, which I will explain in a minute, is that correlated OTs are essentially symmetric. So that means we can essentially kind of turn the whole thing around 
like transpose, uh, if you will, and as an output of that step, we get n correlated OTs of length kappa. So imagine uh, before we had a few OTs and now suddenly we have a lot of OTs that are much shorter. And in the last step, essentially we uh, use some hashing to break the correlation and then we get, uh, we're back to random OTs and have n random OTs. So where is the crucial step security-wise? That is the correlation because um, the correlation step requires uh, one party to be honest, to stick to the protocol, uh, which I will explain in a minute. So let's look at OT. So here we have a, a standard OT, a couple of standard OT3, uh, and you recognize there's like pairs of strings, and there is uh, choice bits, and then there is like uh, the receiver uh, gets the chosen string as an output. Now, just rewriting things a bit, we can define some uh, Z strings essentially as the difference between the two strings. And that means we can uh, formulate the output that the uh, receiver gets as essentially the first string plus, and that is, a, that is an addition in a, in a vector field, uh, in, a, in a vectoring over, a G, uh, over GF2, uh, plus the bit times the difference. So this is just this is just simple this is just simple rewriting. But then essentially we can uh, drop all this and say, well, instead of having a, a two uh, two strings to be chosen off, we have essentially like the first string and the difference. And and the output of the receiver is essentially the the basic so some some sort of uh, basic string uh, plus the difference if he chooses so. And then it's just a very small step to correlated OT, where it essentially, uh, uh, the definition of correlated OT is that the difference is always the same. So instead of having a Z0, Z1, and so on, we have Y, Y, Y. And the rest, everything of the rest is the same. But of course, uh, as I said, this, if we want to have this based on standard OT, this requires the sender at this stage, uh, to be honest. But I now want uh, to explain like why we can do the transpose. I kind of want to uh, get away from this notion of like we have several OTs to kind of a more global view. And in a sense, it's just rewriting again. So instead of several, having several strings T and several strings Z, we just put them in matrices. So we have a matrix T of bits, a matrix Z of bits, and we have a vector of choice bits X. And then, it is uh, rather straightforward to compute that the output of the receiver is essentially the, uh, the, the combined output of the different uh, OT instances is the kind of base matrix T plus DXZ, whereas DX is a matrix with the choice bits X in the diagonal and zero and zero otherwise. And, uh, if you don't see it uh, right away, uh, you just have to believe me that this is true. So now, going from, again, from standard OT to correlated OT, we actually found that DXZ then turns into the tensor product, product of X and Y. And uh, by that, we mean this is a matrix that contains all the possible products of all the possible entries of the strings X and Y. And then in a kind of last rewriting step, if we say, well, if we uh, cannot define the protocol uh, for a random T, so that the T essentially is an output for, uh, for the sender, we get to this multiplication box. And uh, here, it is very clear that this is essentially symmetric. So we have two parties, they both input the string, and as an output, they get a additive secret sharing of the tensor product. And, and this is essentially at the heart of the OT extension uh, 
proposed by Shai et al. in 2000, uh, 2003, that with some rewriting and introducing this correlation, we get something that is symmetric, and this essentially explains how we can get from copper OTs of length n to n OTs of length copper. Because, yeah, we just turn things around. So now we want to go from uh, passive security to active security. So uh, this is kind of a, a repeat. In the case of an honest sender, the two outputs uh, uh, called Q and T uh, form a random secret sharing of the tensor product of X and Y. So this is how such a matrix uh, would look like for uh, length six. Uh, yeah, length, uh, bit length six of X and Y. Now, if we have a dishonest sender, uh, this can be formulated as follows. So on top of the tensor product, or in addition to the tensor product, um, we get some error. And, and uh, remember, the, yeah, so we have it there, dx, z. So if the sender tempers something, we can rewrite this as uh, x tensor product y plus dx e for some error matrix. And then uh, uh, you can see we get some deviating entries over there. And this gives rise to uh, what is called a selective failure attack. What do we mean, mean by that? Just imagine as an example that at the later stage, the sender will reveal uh, essentially his information for the first column of this, yeah, the first column here, and that means he has to reveal y1, and he has to reveal, reveal the first column of t. Now, the receiver can essentially, uh, can essentially check on him, and the interesting thing now is if x6, oops, sorry. If x6 is zero, that means uh, nothing special happens because zero times whatever is always zero. So everything is, uh, will be fine. On the other hand, if x6 is one, then the receiver will notice that the uh, sender cheated. And as a result, like we would say in a, in a, in a protocol, uh, he will abort. So there is a uh, Essentially, there is a, a chance, there is like a 50 if x6 was generated randomly, which it usually is in our uh, context, there is a 50-50 chance of learning that the bit is zero or failing the protocol. And this is a selective failure, uh, this is a selective failure attack. Uh, we can put this slightly differently. Uh, if there is at least one error in the i row, uh, xi, xi might leak later, but there is a cost of being detected for the sender. So, and now we come to the magic, if you will, of, uh, of, of our work. So remember that the, uh, in case of an honest sender, Q and T are a secret sharing of the tensor product of x and y. So put it a bit differently. If we now, uh, if you denote the columns of q and t as qj and tj, we essentially get this equation that qj plus tj is yj, the jth bit of y times x. Uh, for all j, of course. Now, what we, what we do in our protocol, we check a random linear combination of those equations and uh, we do so by essentially confusing the vectoring and the extension field. So how does it work? Well, actually rather straightforward. So we sample, we sample random coefficients and the sender essentially com uh, computes the random linear combination of his information and this results in V and W and the receiver computes the random linear combination of his information, which is just the matrix Q, and checks against the information received from the sender. So if you now look at the case of a dishonest sender, so then we have in general that Q and T, uh, the, the sum of Q and T is just dx z, uh, denoting the columns of z by z1 to zn. Uh, in case of a dishonest sender, those columns are not all 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. So we get that the columns of dx, uh, z are x 
sure product ZJ. So by sure product, we mean the component-wise uh, the component wise product. So if you put all the equations together, the sender needs to compute V and W that uh, fulfills the equation, uh, the equation, but at the same time, he doesn't know X. And the intuition here is that uh, this is impossible without doing some guessing about X. And this, in turn, is related to the selective failure uh, attack. So essentially, we can kind of bet on a certain X, and then uh, or the, the sender can bet on a certain X, uh, come up with an answer, and the check will go through if his bet was correct. So here we have a, uh, we have an, a quick example about this, this like uh, assuming he cannot deviates in the first OT instance. So all the Z, and then for simplicity, we assume that all the ZJs are 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. So basically, it's the first entry that is the problem. Now, if he assumes that x1 is uh, 0, we see that all the sure products that appear are 0. And that means he can pass the check by, uh, by uh, setting w to 0 and just computing v essentially, honestly, as the random linear combination of the t's. So. Again, the big picture is here. Essentially, he bet, this is a bet on the first bit of x being zero. If he passes the check, he knows that the first bit of x is zero. If he fails the check, he knew he was wrong. So essentially, the observation here is that uh, the adversary, and, or an, a, a corrupted sender, can learn m bits of x with success probability uh, two to the minus m. And putting things together in the, how does it work out in the, in the hashing step? So the hashing step of the passive protocol essentially involves the receiver of the base protocol, which then will become the sender of the extended protocol because there's a transpose step. And this, uh, the random, these inputs or outputs from the random OT will be uh, the hash of QJ and the hash of QJ uh, plus x. And the intuition is here, like, obviously, if you know both qj and qj plus x, then you know x. And, and, uh, and of course, like, there is still, like, some possibility to, like, try several things with the, uh, with the hash function, which we model as a random oracle model. Um, so, basically, to wrap it, to wrap it up, uh, if the sender of the base OT chooses to deviate just a little, he will have uh, little knowledge about X. So he would make to uh, do a lot of uh, hash queries or random oracle queries uh, to break the sender privacy to compute both hashes listed above. On the other hand, he can also choose to deviate a lot, which then make it, uh, makes it very unlikely uh, that he will pass the correlation check. And this is, uh, in, in formal terms, uh, explains the security of our protocol. There is one, si uh, one side issue that I would like to mention, that uh, obviously the, uh, essentially the, uh, which is like the sender, no, yeah, the sender of the base OT, which is the receiver of the extended OT, in the correlation check gives some information about his input y, but uh, that is not, not really a big problem because we have the, uh, the chi chase were randomly uh, generated, uh, so like securely randomly generate, uh, uh, we, require, we require that and we just discard a few bits of y and then uh, this essentially like, uh, 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 essentially, like the sum is like a privacy amplification, so uh, that's not really a problem. So, so much about the theory. Uh, a few words about the implementation, and uh, note well that uh, there's some imp uh, there's some improvements from the paper in here that we made after the camera ready version was due. So, as you can see, uh, we love CPU extensions, especially the cryptographer's delight ASNI. We use it for the PRG and for hashing. 
and of course also for our uh, correlation check, which, which involves uh, operation in uh, extension fields of characteristic two. So of course PCL mult is the is the CPU instruction of our choice. Also a brief word about the transpose step. Uh, previous implementations of OT extensions have noted that they, uh, or people, people who implemented it have noted that they needed Eklund's algorithm. Uh, we found that this is not really necessary, and the reason for that is we don't have, we don't have to transpose like an arbitrary matrix. We have to transpose a matrix that has only 128 rows for security 128. So it's arbitrarily, um, the, it has arbitrarily many columns, but only a very limited number of rows. So if you, uh, if you store the matrix in chunks of 128 times 128, you can do the transpose chunk-wise, and uh, this is very little information, so it fits uh, perfectly into the L1 cache of your CPU, so you don't really need a cache optimized, you don't, Eklund's algorithm is essentially a cache optimized algorithm for matrix transpose. And uh, this brings me to some, some, uh, to some figures of our implementation. So in a, let's say, local network where you have uh, two gigabit per second available, um, you can see that uh, already there, most of the time is spent sending information you have to do because that is just part of the passive OT extension that you have to have, that you have to send kappa times n bits. So if you want to have a billion OT with 128 bit security, you have to send 128 billion bits. And this takes just over a minute. And then there's a small overhead for the computation. So uh, to stick with the theme of, the, of this session, you could say this is like a latte macchiato. You have a lot of milk and a shot of espresso. And then the overhead for the active OT is the sugar. It's not very much in terms of volume but it significantly changes the flavor of your drink. Going on to uh, one billion OTs over, let's say, a wide area network where you only have uh, 50 millibits per second. Uh, here it becomes even, even clearer uh, by far the dominating component is simply your communication and the overhead for uh, uh, for the, doing the computation for the OT extension just becomes negligible. And this brings me to my last slide. So uh, the take home message here is uh, for OT extension, the pipe is the limit. If you can send kappa bits, you can have one random OT with security kappa. And uh, on top of that, if you want to have standard or regular OT, you have uh, for length L, you have to send two L bits, essentially, just send those bits and do some XOR. Um, I didn't go into details of this. So if you can send kappa plus 2L bits, you can have one regular OT with security kappa and input length L. Link input length L. And this concludes my talk. Thank you.